Good morning, everyone. Good, morning. Good, morning. Good to see you. Good to see you. Let's all stand our feet, please, because we want to be able to uh, not only be prepared to worship, but I also want you to be prepared to reach across the aisle if you feel like you want to. Um, and we're going to give you just a moment. You'll see our, our worship team's a little bit more slim today because a lot of ladies, several of the ladies went on a Women of Joy con um, conference this weekend. So um, we're still here. Amen. Yeah. And he is still worthy to be praised. And so first off, let's just welcome him. Father, I thank you that you are present with us, Lord. You promised where two or three are gathered in your name. There you are. And Lord, we're just more than that today. So we are grateful too, Lord, to be able to have a place that we can call home to worship. And I pray, God, that you would help us today not to take any of your wonderful blessings for granted, Lord. We do that all the time, but I pray, God, that you would help us to not we feel like we're, we're entitled, but, Lord, that we would uh, remember how much you're, you have blessed us and how you, Lord, just brought us from one place to the next. And, Lord, you just keep adding to us, and I thank you for that. But I pray that we would never just get too complacent in that. But Lord, we'd reach out. Bring other people in, but also, Lord, and during, that, during the week, we would share the good news with other people, Father. You've been so good to us. And, Lord, it's all that we can do, not to, just, to, uh, just to hold it. We need to give it out and share it with other people. So today, Father, as we gather together, I thank you that you're in the midst that we're going to have a wonderful time in your presence. We're going to lift you up because you promised us if you're lifted up, Lord, you draw me into yourself. And so, Father, I pray, too, that as every person comes to that door today, that you would help us, Lord, to put aside the things that just captivate us. And just for this little while especially, I mean, all throughout the week, but right now, Lord, it would be about you. It would be about hearing from you. It would be about what you would say to us individual, personally and carefully today. And, Father, that we would understand how much you love us, Lord. How, God, though all of, of all the people and the stuff that you created, you attend to us individually, personally and carefully, Lord. Father, that is such an awesome thought to, re, to be reminded of that. And, Lord, even though sometimes I know there's people in this, this congregation, in this fellowship place, Today, Father, that think that you've forsaken them or that you don't know about them. Holy Spirit, help them in whatever that is that's trying to be an enemy and at odds with their faith for today. Father, renew us, refresh us. We pray this in all of God's people say. Amen. 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 Let's work. <laughs>
Amen. You got an opportunity to experience that forgiveness today. You can be seated if you would like. This is the greatest day in the rest of our lives. Why? Because this is the day we can fellowship and hang out with Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Not just on this Sunday, because we have that opportunity every day to fellowship with the Lord. It's great to fellowship with you, too, to hang out with some cool people. Just tell somebody you're a cool person. I tell somebody close to you. And you're a cool person. Father, we do have such a great honor and opportunity to fellowship, to be with the Lord today. And I, I know that, and I've thought about it this week, and yet it's still amazing when I stop to think that the creator of all the universe wants to spend time with me. There's nothing I got to offer you, God. There's nothing special about me. He just loved me and every one of us so much that you just want to be with us. That's amazing. Thank you. Lord. You love us so much and you want to be with us so much. Jesus, you gave your life on a cross just so we could have fellowship. Thank you, Lord, that we can have fellowship together. Thank you for the freedoms in this nation. And thank you for even men and women in this congregation and many others who have fought to give us this freedom, God. And let us never think it's just another Sunday. It's just another day to go to church. No, this is a great opportunity and a great privilege. And thank you, Lord, for the freedom in our land. Thank you, Lord, that we, we can pray for others. Lord, just thank you for having your hand on Larry. That that things did not go worse and, and he's getting the treatment and Lord just give doctors wisdom and guidance and direction on what to do there and, and Lord we do lift up Miss Betty and, and her family and just, just help them in this time and, and the loss of, of Charlie and Lord every one of us have got things on our heart and our mind and yet you're an amazing God you, you, you heard them you already heard them 
and you want to do something about it, you got it. You're God over everything. Over everything. Thank you. Lord, help me, help us to put aside the, the distractions of our mind and worship our awesome God. Just worship. Amen.
Casey. 
Amen. We're going to end today with one of our favorite songs, our upbeat, fun songs. I thank God. And I hate when I'm playing the piano because y'all know I like to jump around and sing and dance around this one. So I'm going to try to do it confined to back here. But anyway, let's just worship him today and let's thank him like the song says. I thank God.
message today. Kids, we have an exciting day ahead. We are starting our new Kids Church Series, Everyday Armor. So you guys come on out and let's go visit the city to learn about putting on the armor of God. You can guys meet me out in the gym. I'm going to need y'all to help with something before we go upstairs. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I need some help, guys. Take a few boxes and pass them out all over. Yeah, grab some boxes. Yeah, yeah. Just pass them out. That's why the matches are there. Pass them to the front. Pass them to the back. I got one more bag. Nobody's going to get them out today. I want breakfast with you guys, Mike. Come on, Mike. you got to have them, Mike. You got the succession of 53 or so. Just pass the box. You ain't got to just pass the box. And just set a few boxes down the road and pass them around. We're going to have breakfast together. Yeah, just pass them around. You ain't got to serve. Just pass them over the road. Just take one to start with, some of you greasy brain addicts. Just one to start with. Then you can have more active than leftovers. Just don't tell the kids next door. Don't tell the kids yet, don't they? They get angry. I mean, just what are you doing? Are you trying to get done with this? Serving. Trying to act like my pastor. There you go. Thank you, sir. All right, so you won't remember anything else I said today, but you won't remember what I did. Reach them all. Come on, it's It's, you know, William mentioned it a while ago that every Sunday morning before the praise team gets practicing, we, we do have a moment together. And, and they get the question before you do it. We actually have a time of fellowship. So it's not so much about the food, even though we like fellowshipping around food. It's really about fellowship. It's about sharing life together a little bit. And in our busy schedules and in our wide open pace of life, we don't take time to do that enough. No, keep them out there. I don't need them up here. Y'all can hear me preach. I'll be back here behind a curtain even knowing it. Michael can bring it back. I got him over there. Years ago, I Wheaties will. came out with a cereal and they had a logo that said, The Breakfast of Champions. Maybe it was for that era. I don't know. I've never been a big Wheaties fan. But today I want to talk to you about breakfast with the champions. Breakfast with the champions. Now just think about it. If you could start your day every day with somebody across from the breakfast table with you who had wisdom and insight to everything that you were going to face that day. And just think about it. If you already knew that tomorrow morning you got an appointment with somebody to have breakfast with them and that person knew everything that you were going to encounter that day and all the right answers for you. That would be a breakfast we wouldn't want to miss. We'd want to hang out, have fellowship. Some of you guys be sneaking in the back of the box. Man. You want to watch them, honey. Don't let them, nobody leaves in the box. You better watch Harry. <laughs> Just think about a breakfast like that where we would get to spend time with somebody who, who knew what our day was going to be like. So let me ask you, what is your fellowship with Jesus like? How would you describe your fellowship with Jesus? If, if you had to give it some words, if you had to describe it in the, in the best way you know how, how would you describe your fellowship, your daily hangout, your walk with Jesus? I'm not talking about your quiet time. Quiet times are essential. They're very important. We need to have those times for it unplugged from everything else and spend time with the Word and prayer, absolutely necessary. And I'm not talking about just that time. I'm talking about all day long, every day, your fellowship, your walk with Jesus. How, how would you describe that? How about this? What if tomorrow morning you got to sit across the table, breakfast table with Jesus? What would you want to say to him? What would you hope he would say back to you? Breakfast with the champion. You know, God made us for a purpose. A very simple purpose.
purpose, and yet we continue to mess it up. God didn't make us because he needed anything from us. The Father, Son, the Holy Spirit were not up in heaven, anxiously awaiting to make humans so that we could help him handle this world. Nope, he had it all under control by himself. Fine. Let me simplify life for us. God made us for one purpose. To have fellowship with the Father. That's it. Wow. Really that simple? Yeah, really that simple. We bring in so many other things, so many other distractions. And then we brought in something called sin. And that sin broke that fellowship with the Father. But the Father desires fellowship with us so much that he says, I'm going to send my one and only son to die on a cross for you, to shed his blood in his body so I can have fellowship with you again. Because I want fellowship with you that day. And Jesus died on that cross. And he came out of that grave alive to show us it's all about fellowship with the Father. Breakfast with the Father. <coughs> Let's pray before we look at his word. Lord, we fill our lives with so many distractions. Many of them don't mean a thing in the scheme of reality, in the scheme of eternity. We chase after things that even in the months from now we won't even remember. Much less years. Lord, we are busy people. Our pace of life is important. So, Lord, I pray as we look at your word today, you just help us to, to evaluate. I heard, I heard Ronnie sharing this morning, and I, I just thought of the word evaluate, all the things that we feel our day with and our desires, and we would just sift them through you, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. We would get a focus. We would get a desire like never before to just fellowship with our Lord. To just so desire to be with you. Not, Lord, to be put away in a monastery like a monk, but just to do daily life with you. In the workplace, in the schools, at the restaurants, working on a car, whatever it is. We just become more aware and more hungry for you. Breakfast would meet you again. Thank you. I brought those donuts out. Some of you were like, oh, wow. It'd be like making Reese's out of me. You just lost me. I'm the focus on the Reese's. Why we have a desire. We have a lot of desires, don't we? Most of them are innocent, some of them sinful. But we have a desire. Even with a picture of a, a box of donuts, it's a hot and nail sign, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's a desire. So what if we had a desire to be with Jesus so much that it captivated every moment of our John 21. Hope you got a Bible. <clears throat> You've been reading and understanding. If you don't, I'd love to give you one after the service. John 21, verses 1 to 3. Later, by the Sea of Tiberias, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples. This is what happened. Simon Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana in Galilee, Zebedee's sons and two other disciples of Jesus were there. Simon Peter said to the others, I'm going fishing. They told him, we're going with you. They went out in a boat but didn't catch a thing that night. So let's go back a little bit. If we 
remember Easter Sunday morning, Mary and some others have gone to the grave. The grave is empty. Mary encounters Jesus, and Jesus actually gives a prophecy of the story we're looking at today. He says, tell my followers to go to Galilee, where I will meet up with them. So guess what? They're in Galilee now. In fact, the Sea of Tiberias is actually the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias was the Roman name. Galilee was the Jewish name. So they are there. And they are hanging out, waiting to be with Jesus. Look who's there. I like what one historian said. He said, this was the proof of problem children. <laughs> There's Peter. We know about some of Peter's outburst and some of Peter's denial. There's Thomas, who's definitely showed his doubt. Nathaniel, maybe you don't remember Nathaniel too much, but the first time he sees Jesus, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? The sons of Zebedee are James and John, and just a few weeks before this encounter, they're jockeying to be the number one and number two guy in the kingdom. They are, oh yeah, we want to be in charge. And then there's two others. This same historian says those two others are probably you and me, because we're all problem children. So we got this crew of guys, and, and Peter says, I'm going fishing. I think there's a powerful lesson in what Peter said right here. When we don't know what to do, let's do what we know to do. I've met a lot of lazy Christians through the years who said, I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do. <laughs> Guess what? I've been a lazy Christian at times in my life, and I use the same excuse. I'm waiting for God to tell me what to do. You know what I've discovered? God usually tells those who are already serving what he wants them to do. You'll find it very difficult to find anybody in this Bible that God spoke to and used in mighty ways who was just sitting around doing nothing. God don't bless lazy. He don't bless spiritual lazy. If we get out and serve where we know to serve and just do something, it's usually then that we hear the voice of the Lord telling us what to do next. One of the things that was so hammered on us very hard as guys when we went to seminary was go join a local church and serve. Don't just come here to be a preacher. And what was amazing was how much it changed my life and the lives of those guys that I knew that we did join a church and we served versus the others who said, well, I'm going to wait to be a preacher who probably hadn't done much serving since. Peter said, I don't know where Jesus is. I'm just come. I'm waiting, but I know what to do. I'm going to fish until he shows up. Do something in the name of the Lord until he tells you what to do next. So Peter says, I'm going to fish Peter's an influencer. They've been around long before <coughs> social media. And he's such an influencer, the rest is, hey, we go on the beach. And so they go fishing. They go fishing all night. And they don't catch a thing. They tie. Now, see, their fishing wasn't like a lot of our fishing. They didn't have a rod and reel that they could throw out there and take a little nap and took a Woke them up. No, no, no. They threw out these big old nets and then they would drag them in. And they'd throw them out again and they'd drag them in. And they've done this all night long. And I think they're tired. Not only do I think they're tired, I think they're frustrated too because at least some of the boat were professional fishermen. They knew what to do. And they got nothing. Sound like a Good morning and a breakfast to the chin. Verses 4 to 6. As the sun was rising, Jesus stood on the shore. The disciples didn't realize that it was Jesus. Jesus asked them, Friends, have you caught any fish? They answered, No, we have. He told them, throw the net on the right side of the boat and you'll catch some. So they threw the net out and were 
are unable to pull it in because so many fish are in it. So I can kind of be there. The sun's starting to rise. Their bodies are tired. Their eyes are tired. They're tired. Jesus shows up, only they don't know Jesus shows up. They see somebody, they just don't know it's Jesus. I don't know if it's the distance from the boat to the shore. I don't know if there's a morning fog. I don't know if it's, you know, Jesus looked a little different after the resurrection. But for some reason, they don't know it's Jesus. You know, I wonder how many times in my frustration and my fatigue and my busyness of my day, Jesus is right there. I just don't know it's Jesus. many times have I missed him right there? Even missed it was his voice who called out, James! He was right there. Only they didn't know it was Jesus. <laughs> Jesus says, friends, haven't you caught any fish? Another one of Jesus' probing questions. Did Jesus ask these guys if they caught fish because he needed information about how well they had fished? No, not at all. Jesus' questions to us are never to gather information from us. It's for us to realize our own current situation. Jesus knew they hadn't caught any fish. He just wanted them to wake up a little bit to their current situation. So he says, guys, y'all caught any fish? Then he used the word friends. And actually, friends is not the best translation of this word. Several Bible translations use friends. Several others use the word child. The word Jesus used was actually child. That's, that's where Bible study gets us a little deeper than Bible reading. The word he used, child, lad, it actually meant one who hasn't matured yet. Now think about this. This land guy, he over here on the shore. And you in the boat, and Peter, James, John, they're professional fishermen. They did this for a living. And this land guy saying, hey, you children, you immature ones, have you caught any fish? How'd that make you feel? What's he talking about? What's he doing? What's he thinking? I'm the fisherman. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> I ain't caught no fish yet. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that important here? I think it's important because I think it connects back to another story that's very similar to this. In Luke chapter 5, Jesus was just starting his public ministry. And he's got this big crowd of people who are following him. He wants to teach them, only they're down by the seashore, and he's got nowhere to teach them. And so he asked at that point, almost two strangers, Peter and Andrew, hey guys, can, can I get on your boat? You push the boat out a little bit, let me teach the people. And they said, okay, we'll do it. And so Jesus teaches the people, and after he's through teaching, he says, hey, Peter, won't you throw your net over there? And Peter's like, look, we fished all night. We ain't caught nothing. But if you say so, we'll do it. And they did. And they caught so many fish, they had to call their friends, James and John. Hey, get over here and help me bring all these fish in. Flashback. <laughs> Jesus took them back to the day they started on the journey with them. Throw your net over there. Well, this time they do it, and evidently without any words of resistance, Get so many fish, they can't pull them into the boat. You know what this tells me, guys? This tells me that Jesus is Lord over everything. I know you've heard me say that, but it's got to sink in my head and yours too. Jesus is Lord over everything. In the middle of their frustration, in the middle of their fatigue, in the middle of their failure, Jesus is right there. He's right there. He's right there instructing them. 
He's right there telling them, do this. Do it this way. Right in the middle of our fatigue. Right in the middle of our frustration. Right in the middle of our failure. Jesus is there trying to direct us in what to do. He ain't left us alone. If Jesus is concerned enough to put fish in a guy's net, he is concerned about everything you and I deal with on a daily basis. This is just fish. My problems, your problems, they all are bigger than fish. Jesus is concerned enough about the fish. Because he's concerned about me. He's concerned about you. He's concerned about me and everything that happens there in our day. And friends, if Jesus directs the winds and the waves and the fish, my problems, your problems are not a problem for him. He's got it. You fill in the it. Okay? He's Got it. Just put whatever you want to in the end. Jesus, throw it over there. I'm going to send you a whole bunch of fish. What you've been striving for all night long, I got it. If you listen to me, that's fellowship. That's part of fellowship. And I'm going to listen to Jesus instead of trying to figure it out myself. Breakfast with the champion. Verses 7 and 8. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It's the Lord. <clears throat> it's just a cool phrase. It's, I know it's short. It's the Lord. Ronnie, Mike, those of you who serve with me a lot, just sometimes remind me. It's the Lord. He's here with us on Monday morning. He's here with us on Thursday afternoon. He, it's the Lord. He's here. I just need to hear that sometimes. It's the Lord. He's here. Maybe you need to hear it in your workplace. Maybe you need to hear it in your school. In the craziness of your household sometimes. It's the Lord. He's here. Spouse, maybe you need to remind the spouse. Well, when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord. He put back on the clothes that he had taken off and jumped into the sea. The other disciples came with the boat and dragged the net full of fish. They weren't far from the shore, only about a hundred yards. The disciple whom Jesus loved was John. John got it. I don't know how John got it. I don't know if it was remembering the story from Luke 5. I don't know if it's John's level of faith. I don't know how John got it, but John got it. That's Jesus. And when he told Peter, Peter would have likely been in his underwear because that was how the men normally fished. Once they got away from the shore, so they weren't real close to people, they would take off their outer garments so not to destroy them or mess them up, and they would typically fish in their underwear. But being in your underwear was not appropriate to stand before your mentor, teacher, and Lord. So Peter puts his clothes back on and jumps in. Most of us are thinking, why do you put your clothes on? And just, but that was the most honorable way to do it. You know, Peter, he gets a pretty tough rap about his impulsiveness from time to time in the scriptures. And rightfully so, sometimes, but not this time. Nobody else in the boat was so excited about seeing Jesus enough that they dove in to get to him. Nobody else in the boat thought it was more important to be with Jesus than to mess with a boat and a bunch of old fish than Peter. Yeah, we can look at Peter's life and say, well, there were times he should have put the reins on that impulsiveness and what he said and what he did. And guess what? There's times when you and I need to do the same thing. But there's also times we need to learn from his impulsiveness. Peter says, it's Jesus. I'm diving in to get to him. I want to be with Jesus. Fish don't matter anymore to me. The boat don't matter anymore to me. I just want to be with Jesus. And he dove right in. God, it's right in the middle of our work day. Right in the middle of our busyness. What if we had such a desire just to be with Jesus that we don't dive towards him for a moment or two? 
Man, God has given us such a beautiful week this week. Wednesday morning, I got up and it was a nice, cool, crisp morning. Got out to the Spitfire. The top was already down. I love driving next to cool. So I headed to the connection. The sky was just perfect. Blue. I mean, it was so good. And I drive up to the back of the connection. The trees so green. The grass is so green. And I just stopped. I had Jesus in the tribe with me, and I just said, Lord, thank you. It is so beautiful. Your sky is so beautiful. Your trees are so beautiful. And in my curious mind, I stopped and said, why did you make the sky blue? Why are the trees green? Miss Francine asked me Thursday night if I got an answer on that. I haven't yet. But, I mean, you could have done it orange. You could have done it lavender. I don't know. You did whatever color you wanted to do. But you did blue and green. And I just... For a moment, guys, I just said, forget about what i got to do today. I'm enjoying hanging out with Jesus. What if we approached every day, all day, all the tasks of the day, during the task of the day, I want to be with Jesus. So we know what happens when we get bad news. Or something tragic comes our way, we'll stop and pray, right? Yeah, we'll stop and pray. We don't need to run to Jesus just when we need something from Jesus. We need to just want to be with Jesus. Peter, at this moment, didn't need anything from Jesus. In fact, Jesus just gave him everything he had tried for all night long, right? A bunch of fish. He said, I want the fish. I want Jesus. Just thinking how radically change our attitude. <laughs> I'm, again, I'm not talking about being a monk who goes off to a monastery and stays hidden in a room just to be. I'm talking about just normal life. These guys were doing normal. They were just fishing. And all of a sudden, they became aware of the fact that Jesus was there. Just like he's always there. Let's look how the story ends. Verse 9. When they went ashore, they saw a fire with a fish laying on the coals. And they saw a loaf of bread. Jesus told them, bring some of the fish you just caught. Simon Peter got into the boat and he pulled the net ashore. Though the net was filled with 153 large fish, it was not full. Jesus told him, come and break us. None of the disciples dared to ask him who he was. They knew he was the Lord. Jesus took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This was the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he had come back to the Lord. Okay, I read this part of the story again, and I was like, okay, questions that start popping in my mind. Where did Jesus get that fish and bread? He's Lord over everything. I don't know where he got it. Maybe he said, fish, jump out of the water. He's Lord over everything. Maybe he turned the stones into bread. Evidently he can do that because Satan tried to tempt him to do that before. I don't know where he got it. He's Lord over everything. But he says, hey guys, bring some of your own fish over here. 153 fish. Why 153 fish? I don't know. <laughs> but I do know this. People who make up stories don't usually give exact numbers. You know when we read a story in the Bible that just seems so hard for us to believe and like, really? Did that really happen? Let's just dig a little deeper and look at the evidence. 153. That's a precise number. Why? Because it was a true story that happened just like we've just seen and heard it. 
153 fish. Then Jesus told them, Come, have breakfast. Now see, for our mindset, our pace of life, that means gobbling down a cup of coffee and a donut and running on the line. Get the day going. We ain't got time to sit around and talk. But for Jesus, and for those of you who are fishermen, you know, you don't have fish for breakfast. You got to clean that fish. <laughs> then you got to cook that fish. Their pace of life was a lot slower. This was a time of fellowship. <laughs> this was a time of hanging out with Jesus. In fact, if you want to know how much fellowship it was, keep reading the story because there's a lot more to the story. But this is a time to sit around and with Jesus. I don't know, maybe they had a Q&A of everything that's happened since the garden. I don't, I don't know what they talked about. But what I see here is fellowship. And the scriptures say this was the third time that Jesus had showed himself to them. Three was an important number for the Lord. Three days Jesus was in the grave. Three times he showed them, <coughs> he showed himself to them. And we know there's going to be another time at the Ascension, but I think at the Ascension it was a big crowd of people based on what we can read. I think this was probably the last intimate fellowship they had with the physical Jesus. I'm just, I'm just thinking that. I'm not sure. But I know this was a fellowship time. I said it last week and I'll say it again. Folks, we got the greatest opportunity ever given to humanity today and every day. And it has nothing to do with accomplishing our to-do list. It has nothing to do with even serving and doing great things for the Lord. It's getting to be in fellowship with the Lord. That's the greatest thing that can happen today. It's the greatest thing that can happen tomorrow. That we just recognize Hey, that's Jesus over there. <laughs> and we recognize his voice when he says, James, do it this way, not the way you've been doing it all night long, because that ain't worth it. <laughs> and we just have breakfast, <coughs> lunch, supper, afternoon snack, whatever it is, we do it with Jesus. And by the power and the presence of his Holy Spirit, we can. Because he is here. I know you've got stuff to do today. And you got stuff to do tomorrow. It's, it's going to be a busy week. Every week's a busy week, ain't it? Are you looking forward to time with Jesus? Are you planning time with Jesus? Are you desiring time with Jesus so much you just dive in the water to get to him? And if not, do you know him as your Lord and Savior, Lord over everything? Folks, he really did die on that cross for you. And he really did come out of that grave alive so that you and I could be saved from our sin and have fellowship with the Lord. Today, call upon the name of the Lord and know him as Savior. Christian, what's, what's keeping you from that fellowship? Jesus like you once had. You remember that sweet time of fellowship with him. What's, what's keeping you back now? Today is the day to commit, recommit to fellowship with Jesus. Would you stand with me as I pray? Lord, I thank you so much for your word. It shows us these pictures of just how real you are and how real you want to be in our everyday life. You really do want to do life with us day by day, step by step. You really do want us to fellowship with you. So Lord, whatever's holding us back, whatever's
got a wall between us and you, whatever frustration, fear, failure, Lord, let us lay it down. Maybe at the altar, maybe at the cross, maybe you need to come to one of us, myself or some guys at the back, and just say, pray, help me. I want fellowship with Jesus. And maybe today, you need to seek Him as your Lord and Savior, asking for the forgiveness of your sin, and all the sweet things.